thank you very much everyone for having me today. Um, you may have joined some other presentations from me before with Macmillan, where we really went into the detail of the, a framework for global citizenship education and how to incorporate it into the classroom. Um, I hope we will get a little bit of time to sort of do it um, a teaser of that towards the end of the talk. But actually what I wanted to do today was ask this question, what exactly is a global citizen? What is the, the purpose of global citizenship education? Um, because it is such a broad area and there is diverse perspectives. So I hope you'll join me on um, what is a bit of a journey. Um, we will be first looking at sharing some perspectives on what we think a global citizen is. Um, I can then show you some common perspectives you can find um, in education, looking at my research. I'll propose my own perspective and a framework for implementing GCE as, as it's often referred to in shorthand um, in ELT. And then we'll also look at why ELT is such a good um, subject for GCE and how we can actually practically integrate it in the classroom. So my first question for all of you, and please um, put your comments in the chat, is what or who do you picture when you think of the term global citizen? Take a mental photo of that individual or series of individuals and uh, describe them in the chat. Teresa, maybe could you just, um, because I can't access that at the same time, I wonder if you could read out what just a couple okay. of things. Yeah, flexible, tolerant of diversity, uh, tolerant. Dalai Lama says Rajni. <laughs> Brilliant. People. Let's see if there are any more. 21st century skills says Marina. Radka says me. Natasha, uh, brilliant brilliant. Um, Natasha says society. Andrea says a citizen aware of global warming. Monica says no nationalities. Marjorie says inclusion. Globe, a guru, says Michaela, an open minded person, someone who can adapt to different parts, having wide perspectives, patient, cooperative, tolerant people. Young people, diversity, okay. unity. Uh, someone is aware of various cultures, diversity, and has various experiences. Thank you. That, that's fantastic. And actually, I have been able to work out how to get the chat up at the same time. So I can see, mm. for example, Maria and uh, Miranda. That's brilliant. Um, so interesting already, you can see what a, what a diverse um, perspective we have on what it means to be a global citizen. Um, let's look at some other examples. Maybe you think of someone like this when you think of a global citizen. Leonardo DiCaprio, a famous celebrity campaigning for climate change, uh, speaking to the UN, um, you know, affecting change, trying to bring people together. Maybe you think about this, maybe you think about um, two successful international um, business people, um, going across different cultures comfortably, uh, traveling all over the world, um, etc. Or do you think about this? Do you think about maybe Malala or Greta? Someone mentioned uh, the Dalai Lama earlier, maybe someone that has given their life to a particular cause and, um, and championed it and reached prominence as a result of that. But what about this? What about a teacher? and their students. I think actually, um, hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, we will all agree that really the, te the teacher is one of the most pivotal global citizens you can possibly imagine. Um, just by joining this particular um, conversation today, and you've joined Dave earlier, you can see already that you're communicating across cultures, you are looking ahead to the next generation, you are preparing the next generation for the challenges they will face in the future. Um, and your actions are every day in the class, in the classroom and outside of it. Um, so all of those um, global citizens are perfectly valid. But I think in particular, the teacher is you know, one of the most um, inspirational uh, examples of a global citizen you can imagine. 
Uh, so let's let's think then instead of can we find a definition for a global citizen? Can we find an agreed definition? Well, there isn't one. Um, there are there is like diverse interpretation of this term, and as a result of the education that is needed to uh, develop global citizenship. I'm just going to show you three. So here is Oxfam's. A global citizen is someone who is aware of and understands the wider world and their place in it. They take an active role in their community and work with others to make our planet more peaceful, sustainable and fairer. Then you have UNESCO, um, you know, one of the most high profile champions of GC, um, because, of course, they, they really popularized it when they introduced it into the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So here's UNESCO's definition. Being a global citizen is a way of understanding, acting, and relating oneself to others and the environment in space and in time based on universal values through respect for diversity and pluralism. In this context, each individual's life has implications in day-to-day -day decisions that connect the global with the local and vice versa. I don't know about you, but I find that a much harder definition to get my teeth into. There's a lot there. Um, and in fact, when we look at um, different interpretations of GC, UNESCO can often be positioned at the center uh, because there is quite a lot of room for interpretation in that very broad definition. Or then we have the OECD. Their definition is of a global citizen is to live harmoniously in multicultural societies, to thrive in a changing labor market, to use media platforms effectively and responsibly, and to support UN sustainable development goals. So already you can see there's no consensus and there's some difference between those three definitions, just looking at those three. So I would like to suggest that we need to ask whenever we come across global citizenship or global citizenship education, we need to ask who is promoting it? Why are they promoting it? You know, what is their agenda? Do they have an agenda? And to what end? What kind of global citizen does that individual organization, Ministry of Education, uh, what kind of global citizen do they seek to develop? And also, what do we think as individuals? Um, a classic example of being incredibly critical, which as teachers, uh, we train our students in all the time, and um, we also do ourselves. Here are some perspectives. So this, this is what uh, I've looked at a lot in my research. Um, when you look at GCE and how it's implemented, there are broadly um, these five different um, possible interpretations. So the one at the top, neoliberal, that's basically a view of global citizenship education where the global citizen that you're, you're desiring to achieve is effectively um, a active participant in the global economy. So we're talking things like entrepreneurial spirit, uh, really good communication skills, the ability to work across different cultures. But a neoliberal perspective focuses um, predominantly on that or, or almost exclusively on that, sometimes to the detriment of other aspects of GCE. Then we have a nationalist perspective. This is where you might find global citizenship used in national education curricula, but really it's just used as a buzzword. And basically the education is really more national uh, citizenship education. There's not that same connection to the global community and, um, and the sense of rights and responsibilities we all have, not just as um, members of our own nation state, citizens of our own nation state, but also citizens of this wider world. Then there's activist. So this is global citizenship education with a very specific agenda. So it's where uh, there's a clear direction for the actions that students need to take and a clear perspective on what's wrong with the world and what um, this framework seeks these students to address. Um, and then forgive me for the photo. I couldn't think of a, a better photo for Western, by which I mean um, UK, US, Western Europe, um, and, and so on. Um, so you, you have to ha deal with Clint Eastwood here. But the, the Western perspective is one where um, a certain Western view of the world um, permeates the interpretation of global citizenship education. And in a way, it can seem to be a little bit colonial 
imposing Western ideals and values onto other contexts, which really isn't in keeping with the aspirations of global citizenship education. And then finally, there's the critical interpretation. And this is one that I'd like us to spend a little bit more time on. This is the one which I think uh, is particularly powerful. And I hope you also find actually inspiring because it really helps you think about how to question the world around you. Um, and you can broadly see it as questioning some of these other perspectives and um, the underlying power structures of the world. So let's look at, let's look at critical a bit more. Um, can I ask you to imagine a field of corn, harvest the corn and place it in front of your mind's eye. Uh, tell me in the chat, what do you see when you look at that harvested corn? Describe the corn, what, what color is it? What does it look like? Uh, Rabi is saying yellow, Martha's saying yellow, orange, Natasha, I think Clara, yellow, mustard, Anna saying mustard, beige, shiny yellow, green and yellow, yellow. Nandita saying multicolored. Um, Anil saying yellow, Andrea saying mustard. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. Keep it coming, keep it coming. Uh, blue. Someone said blue. Fantastic. Mexican colors. Brilliant. Uh, and we've got green as well from Marisol and purple even from Evelyn. Brilliant. Um, so this is an exercise that uh, Vanessa Andriotti, uh, a very um, famous researcher in this field who I who I do recommend you, you have a look at if you're interested in this um, particular area of global citizenship. This is an exercise that uh, she recommends. And here is the, uh, the striking illustration of a very real um, corn harvest. And you can see lots of different colors here, multicolored, uh, even within themselves. So what a, what a different range. And what, um, what Professor Andriotti is trying to get us to think about here is the danger of a single story. So the danger that we can get caught up in these, um, these single perspectives of the world around us. Um, and there, there are many dangers posed by that. Um, there's a TED talk here as well that I recommend you watching called The Danger of a Single Story, which talks about one author's experience of how growing up, she used to read all these childish stories, ch sorry, childhood stories about children playing in, um, rainy England and having strawberry jam sandwiches and all this, none of it resonating with her own lived experience in Nigeria. Um, so you can see how if we don't really question the world around us, there's a danger that we all think that the corn cob is yellow and therefore we should all want to be yellow. In the educational context, it could mean that we have one perspective on what a global citizen could be. And rather than celebrating the development of all of this, this different, this diversity amongst global citizens, we're trying to create uh, this conveyor belt of these yellow corn cobs of global citizens. So this single perspective. Um, so I, I hope you found that interesting. That, that's really what the critical perspective is all about, questioning the world around us. Um, so given that, I encourage you to question my own perspective, but this is the perspective that um, I and a number of others would advocate around how to think of GCE. And this is something that I've also worked with Macmillan Education on. Um, what you see here is the Bloom's taxonomy applied to global citizenship education. So it should have knowledge, it should have attitudes and actions, and it should have a layer of skills wrapped around that. But importantly, as regards these actions, um, this Paolo Freire quote kind of guides the perspective behind this, that Education doesn't change the world, it changes people, and it's really people that change the world. And with that, um, with that very thought-provoking quote in mind, the purpose, therefore, of this framework is to provide students with knowledge about the world around them and the skills they need to engage with that world and to take actions in that world to address issues they care about, but ultimately those actions are to, for them to decide that it's not for us as teachers or as educators to impose our view of what actions should be against these, these big global crises. It's for students and individual global citizens to decide that themselves. But let's look a bit, bit more detail around this. So if we look at the knowledge domain, um, you can also refer to this as global orientation. And I would define this as 
developing in our students a positive, confident view of the world and the citizens' role in it. And that breaks down into a number of different learning outcomes. We want them to encounter their responsibility for positive global outcomes. So each citizen has a part to play in addressing these big global issues, whether it's climate change, poverty, inequality, um, gender stereotyping, racial um, justice, whatever it may be, each citizen has a responsibility for a positive and by extension, a negative global outcome. We also want to expose students to multiple global cultures so they can feel confident engaging across cultures, accepting differences and celebrating different perspectives. We want them to encounter ideas of global interdependence to recognize in the 21st century, we are all part of this big world and everything we do impacts each other. It really isn't possible anymore to be siloed in our individual um, communities or nations. We also want them to learn about the global institutions such as the UN. Um, so that having that knowledge, they can then um, take actions that may be appropriate within those frameworks according to how they would like to act. And then finally, we want them to encounter this concept of having a um, multifaceted identity. So they can have their national identity, but also their identity as part of the global community, and also even their identity as a Star Wars fan or their religious identity, or other, other cultural identities. So going back to those different perspectives we saw earlier and what I'm advocating here as, um, you know, what I hope is the appropriate perspective on GC, um, in the context of knowledge, it's a diverse view of the world with multiple perspectives. It's not Western centric. Um, it exposes students to cultural and national complexities. So we don't want to see content, for example, that may provide a shallow or stereotype perspective on a particular culture or country. It should be a really critical perspective of the world and its injustices. So we want to try and avoid that um, uh, savior approach or that kind of heroic charitable approach and instead question the injustice of the world at a larger level. So rather than uh, unquestioningly um, donating to a cause in a developing country or going abroad to, to do some volunteering work, uh, we encourage students to think about their own part in the, the, the injustice of the world at a global level. Why should it be that if you are born here in London, you have much better opportunities than you might do if you're born in another part of the world? And that's, that's really starting to question the world around them. And then also it's an outlook for every citizen. So there is no exception. This, this should be um, a universal concept. It does not require um, students to be traveling all over the world. It does not require uh, them to be only tackling issues at a global level. If anything, it's about connecting those global issues that we all face to their local um, expression. So if it's climate change, it's, it's looking at how climate change is impacting you at a local level. Um, and then in terms of skills, we can think of these really as global skills. And that's important. That word global is really important in this context because sometimes you might see skills in the context of global citizenship education divorced from the global issues that they're really designed to address. So 21st century skills and life skills, for example, um, have a lot of overlap here, but the key difference is that rather than developing these skills in isolation, we want to develop them in contexts in which global issues are raised. So all of these, um, uh, the, the four C's and these other skills that you would have come across before, it's not about just addressing them in isolation, it's looking at projects or tasks where students can communicate, but in the context of global issues. So, and we'll look at some other examples later, but it could be presenting a uh, solution to a local issue to um, a key stakeholder or decision maker locally. Uh, it could be, in terms of creativity, it could be coming up with that solution in the first place. Um, so I think just to highlight on this, this particular area, I just want to highlight again that this is very much not just about developing skills that, for a student to compete in the global economy, but also to take action against those global issues. 
And then finally, attitudes and action. Uh, this is the domain that in GCE we can refer to as global action. This is really the defining element of GCE. So think about that citizenship aspect. That's the, uh, the really key point here. Global citizenship education is different from global education or development education or some of these other uh, related concepts, maybe like global competencies, for example, which came up in this morning's talk, because of this identifier citizenship. And as we all know, as citizens, wherever we are, being a citizen gives you rights and responsibilities. And that's the key thing here around action. So with global citizenship, it is about acknowledging those rights, some of which are enshrined in the UN human rights, some of which you'll have at a local level, and then acting on them. Um, and without going into all of these, um, I think if you look at the, the bottom example, this idea of students being actively encouraged to exercise their responsibility as global citizens, one way of doing this in the classroom is to provide um, examples of how other global citizens have addressed an issue. For example, about, um, let's say, um, loneliness of, um, of pensioners and the elderly in their area. Um, and then ask them how they might tackle an issue of their choosing. Uh, so you can still encourage action whilst keeping it um, personal and specific to those students. Um, conscious of time, let, let's skip that one if you don't mind. Um, so why English language teaching? Why should we care about this in ELT? I think it helps in this respect to think of it as both an opportunity and an imperative. So. Dave talked a little bit about the opportunity earlier. Uh, English, of course, <coughs> of course, forgive me. Um, English is the world's common language. So if we are going to be engaging, communicating with citizens from all over the world, it most likely is going to be in English. And in fact, um, through ELT, you will be exposed to citizens from lots of different nationalities and cultures. Um, given 75% of non-natives so of, of English language speakers are non-native. And so global citizenship gives you a framework in which to do that. Also in the context of the classroom and in textbooks, we need content in which to develop language skills. So there is this, this fertile ground in which to raise some of these global issues. And finally, students want it. Uh, again, going back to today's talk, I think you mentioned um, one of the students saying how much they enjoyed engaging with students from other cultures and that the English language felt like a great um, context in which to do that, indicating that appetite we have amongst our students. Uh, there was also a recent Instagram report that pointed out that its most active users are social justice advocates. So there is this thirst to engage with some of these global issues. Unfortunately, that turns us to the imperative because one of the reasons why there's such a thirst is because when um, the youth of today look to the future, they can feel afraid, anxious, and powerless. Um, there was a recent uh, report by the Nature Journal on this, which found that over 60% of that younger generation are worried about the, the future and have these feelings of anxiety and, and powerlessness. So with GCE, you give them a framework in which to have agency, in which to feel like the individual actions they do do matter and they can make an impact in the world. Of course, also um, bearing in mind some of the history around ELT textbook production in particular and resources, um, it, it does set, tend to um, sit in the hands of a small number of we largely Western based publishers. So you can also argue that for ELT publishers such as Macmillan um, or OUP, Cambridge, Pierce and others, the imperative here is to make sure that when we are putting content into textbooks that are gonna be used all over the world. We are not perpetuating Western perspectives. We're not imposing those views on the world, but we are actually uh, going back to Vanessa Andriotti, thinking really critically about the world. And that, that is where GC is a very helpful framework. And then finally, how do we do all this? Uh, in a word, it's CLIL. And I'm sure um, many of you would have used CLIL throughout your career already, content and language integrated learning. So um, we have this precedent for how we can bring different subjects into the development of the English language. Um, 
in fact, um, going back to uh, uh, my own time at the Middle Education, this is a, a fun picture of Dave um, at the Ministry of Education in Bahrain 10 years ago, promoting one of the earlier um, Gateway series. And in that early series, Dave talked about something called Click, which was kind of like a CLIL plus. Cross-curricular topics were integrated into textbooks, as well as literature, but also international cultural knowledge. So uh, no surprise that in Dave's new work, global center education is very much present because um, he's been working on that in that vein for many years. Uh, which leads me to some practical examples. So here is a practical example of how you can bring GCE into the classroom, uh, in this case, by the textbook. So here is a project task where students are asked to research life in their country and to present it to teenagers from another country using the virtual classroom exchange. Um, by the way, you could also, if you don't use that textbook, you could also partner with the British Council's Connected Classrooms, which allows classrooms to connect all over the world. That's a great way of engaging students across cultures, whilst also doing so through um, topics that could be around global issues as well. So maybe they work on a collaborative project together. Um, for other examples, um, I have an article on One Stop English that I hope would be helpful. That's got some very practical um, lesson ideas. And also I've done a, a couple of webinars with Jonathan Hadley, a very experienced ELT teacher, where we again look at really practical examples of embedding GC in the classroom. And I would also recommend uh, Nesma Suleiman and Nathan Waller's talk on GC in Egypt, where Nesma, in her role as a primary school teacher of English, talked about how she could bring you could bring environmental issues into the classroom. And it is really fantastic to see that uh, not only um, is it very doable to integrate GC into an ELT context, uh, her students really relished it and it increased the um, engagement in the class. So a final thought then before we um, hopefully pick up uh, some questions, I came across this quote recently um, in, a, in a shop here in the UK, and it's by a zero waste cookbook author called Anne-Marie Bonneau. We don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions doing it imperfectly. And I think that's just such a great concept which you can uh, transfer to GC as well, that I know this must seem quite a big daunting task, but um, we don't need a handful of people doing it perfectly. We need millions doing it imperfectly. And um, I think just starting your journey, you'll hopefully build a, a passion and enthusiasm for it. And I'm sure your students will respond to it too. So thank you very much. I will stop there and please do reach out to me directly as well. I've got my, my links uh, there and I'll also share the slides afterwards. Um, you touched on something very important, which we, there was a question in the in Dave's uh, session, um, Matt, uh, with that quotation about doing projects imperfectly. Um, a question we didn't have time to answer in the last session was, um, what if the students don't actually achieve an end result? Is that still um, a successful project, a successful collaboration? What do you I, think? Yes. I think it is in a word, absolutely. So um, we, we talked about this in, in the earlier um, time zone for this as well, where we talked about, is it possible to assess global citizenship? And uh, we had some back and forth with other teachers and realized it's very difficult, but you can assess the, their exposure to these ideas and being able to put their, you know, be able to articulate what the challenges that they would like to address and come up with some ideas to to tackle them. But I don't think that um, they necessarily have to be successful. And in fact, uh, I think it was Nes Nesma in her talk that um, talked about how she feels like her classroom should be where students can make mistakes and can fail because they're being prepared for a wider world. And so better to have that in the safe environment of the classroom. Um, yes. And I think the journey that students are taking towards thinking about and, and, and talking about and reading about and looking around them is also 
a great gain for the students, don't you think? Abs yeah, absolutely. I think one of the mm. things that um, uh, we worked on a lot when I was um, working with Macmillan on their own framework for global citizenship is this idea that when you look at some of the outcomes around the action domain, uh, yes, projects around addressing a global issue are great, but also we can consider a critical consciousness as part of the action domain. So uh, if, if students are questioning the world around them and going quite deep in questioning common assumptions and why things are as they are, that's almost as important as addressing those global issues because that is a life skill that they can carry with them for the rest of their life. Mm, yes, I would agree with that. I think that very wise, very wise, Matt. Thank you so much. Now, there are one or two other little kind of, there's a little bit of hesitancy. Um, Tom uh, says that questioning certain behaviours in some countries is seen as indirect opposition to those in power. Um, yeah. And Daphne uh, also, uh, or Daphne, uh, echoes this, uh, that sometimes authorities don't mm -hmm. like students being involved in certain aspects. So, you know, I, that's a, a worry that maybe a lot of teachers have. Is there anything that you can uh, advise in that field? I'm so glad that you asked that because we shouldn't hide away from that. It is, it, yes, it is difficult. Um, and we shouldn't pretend that the, the, full, the fullest ideals of GC are going to be possible in all contexts. Um, what I would say is that in my research, looking at GC in public school textbooks in the UAE, which um, some might say has you know, th that same, um, uh, you know, very different perspective to how you might question authority than you would in the UK or in the West. Um, there, um, they do have um, contexts in which um, societal and governmental priorities are questioned. So thinking of one very specific example, um, the students are encouraged to look at the UAE's investment into the space race in Mars, and the UAE have done this um, uh, very impressive um, Mars project. And the, and the questioning for the students is, is this the right uh, use of government resources? Should it actually be spent on the health service, et cetera? And there are some templates and some back and forth. And this is, these are textbooks that were co-created with the Ministry of Education. So I think um, I, I couldn't speak myself to your particular context. You would know better than I. But clearly in that particular context, they found a way to engage with the questioning aspect uh, to a degree. Uh, of course, they, they weren't questioning um, the rulers themselves, but they were subtly questioning uh, that those priorities. And so um it, it is doable but i don't um i don't shy, hide away from, hide away from the fact that you can, you're going to have to adapt it to a particular context absolutely yeah so it, it, teachers um you know choosing i presume what topics are safe um in their country um the wisdom of the teacher there is a global citizen absolutely also and, and i suppose informing. also yeah, absolutely and i suppose also um this is where uh, textbooks and other resources could help because maybe if you're if you're as we often have in ELT if you're a, a teacher that's come from another co context into that one you might feel uncomfortable making those decisions early on and we've seen examples where um, teachers thought they were on the right side of it but but uh, weren't um, and so that is potentially where textbooks can help and that's why it's great that Millen is doing what it's doing because those textbooks will have gone through an approval process. And so you can feel you can feel comfortable in that in that content. But wherever you can bring in your own ideas as well, of course, that's even more powerful as a teacher. Thank you so much.